Welcome to a special 15-year anniversary episode of Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Christina Lomasny. Christina co-founded Maju Metal in 2006 and now serves as the Chief Executive Officer and President. Christina, thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your company? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on your podcast. This is such a pleasure to be able to connect with the National Nanotechnology Initiative and and to share a little bit of our own nanotechnology story. So Maja Metal is a, we're a nanolaminated alloy manufacturing company, which basically means uh, we're producing a novel class of materials that are like metallic plywoods with really, really thin plies. And these materials allow us to produce very high performance alloy systems, components, corrosion resistant coatings that can be used in a number of applications, pretty much wherever steels and metals are used today. Can you share a little bit about how corrosion has an impact on the economy? Certainly. So one of the first applications of our nanolaminated alloys is in this area of corrosion mitigation. It's a challenge that plagues everything from our infrastructure to our modes of transportation to construction. And it's been estimated globally the cost of corrosion, so this is the direct cost of corrosion, costs us about $2.1 trillion. In the United States alone, it's over 3% of our gross domestic product that's spent on corrosion. So it's, it's obviously a very big issue especially now as we're as a nation talking about infrastructure and the challenges associated with maintaining an aging infrastructure. Corrosion is one of those problems that keeps creeping up and obviously is constantly battling with us as we try to maintain critical infrastructure components. So our goal at Maja Metal is to leverage existing materials, so commonly used corrosion mitigation coatings and alloy systems and basically to architect them in a novel way. So creating these nano-layered alloy systems to be able to mitigate the impact of corrosion, so delay the onset of corrosion. But the significance of our system is that because we're using the same basic raw materials that are used in corrosion mitigation today, we can achieve that goal very cost competitively. And in fact, in some areas, we can actually be cheaper than the current solutions. The ultimate goal for Maja Metal is to be able to deliver infrastructure that doesn't last decades, but rather centuries. Christina, the the approach that Maju Metal takes is very different from conventional metals manufacturing. Can you discuss a, a little bit Uh, more about the process that you use for making these nanolaminated alloys? Absolutely. So first of all, when we're talking about nanolaminated alloys, it's important to note that these are materials, it's a class of materials that have been around for a very long time. First mention of nanolayering materials was actually made over two decades ago. So while this is a really, really innovative class of materials being deployed industrially, it has a long history in academic research and it has been around for quite some time. The challenge has been how to manufacture these materials at any kind of appreciable scale so that they can impact the kinds of industrial challenges we at Maja Metal are now targeting with, the, um, with this, this uh, class of nanolayered alloys. If we can't produce cost effectively, we can't really deliver a solution to industrial sector markets. And so that was the breakthrough that Maja Metal achieved was a manufacturing process that could be scaled and could be scaled economically. Where we departed from conventional metals manufacturing, so if you think about conventional metals manufacturing, the input form of energy is heat. And heat comes either in as fuel or through a relatively inefficient conversion of electricity to heat. And basically, the manufacturing process is limited in its ability to deliver these kind of fine scale tailored features that we're talking about when we're talking about nano laminated alloys. So we had to really think about input energy in a completely different way. And in the case of Maja Metal, we're using electricity directly to grow metal and to manufacture this laminated structure. So it's an electrochemical manufacturing process. There's electricity and chemistry. 
And as I mentioned, we're growing metal. So we're actually reducing metal in situ during the manufacturing process, going directly from a raw material in a, in a salt state into a finished metal in a net shape part or in the case of coatings, as a coating on an existing, for example, low carbon steel. And because of that input form of energy and the fact that we can control electricity on a very fine time scale, we can actually grow these layered alloys in situ in a very efficient way. Um, and so that was the breakthrough that Maja Metal represents. We hold patents now on that technology, that manufacturing technology, as well as trade secrets. And ultimately that's the technology that's being scaled up to bring this technology to major markets. So you mentioned intellectual property and you have an, a number of patents, including several that you personally owed. Can you share your patent strategy? Patenting is actually a kind of an interesting, let's say, a way of protecting intellectual property. So as we think about intellectual property we actually think about protection modes that expand beyond patenting. This concept of patenting actually dates back to uh, ancient British rule when the king would basically give monopolies to individuals and give them what were called patent letters that were basically public announcements that said, so-and-so has the right as decreed by the king to produce you know, playing cards or whatever it was. And so then all of a sudden you had this patent. And one of the requirements of that patent letter was you actually had to disclose, you know, what you were doing. So in some cases, we want the world to know what we're doing so that we can protect our intellectual property. Now we don't have a king, but we have a court. So we can protect our intellectual property in a court environment and protect ourselves from any form of infringement. In other cases, though, where we feel like we can protect our intellectual property better by keeping it a secret, we create IP that's known as trade secrets. And at Modumental, we've taken a holistic approach to how we manage our portfolio of intellectual property. And we do maintain significant parts of our intellectual property as trade secret. So we have patents and we have trade secrets and we have other forms of protection like confidential information that we only disclose to some people. But trade secrets are things like the Coca-Cola formula, if you will, that are kept, you know, where the formula is kept in a vault. And the difference between patented materials and trade secret materials, and the reason that they're important to us, is a patent has a finite duration associated with it. So in order for a patent to be valid, we have to disclose to the world in the form of that patent letter what we're doing. And we get uh, roughly 20 years to protect that intellectual property. And after that 20 years, the information's basically cast in the public domain. Whereas a trade secret, we can hold a secret as long as we're able to protect it and keep that vault locked. So we have a little bit of both and that gives our company some longevity and ability to control the duration of that protection mode in the case of trade secrets. Another thing that's kind of unique in the case of our portfolio is that while we do have several patents that are in our name and have named inventors from among our team, we also have looked at our intellectual property portfolio from the perspective of how we'll protect it in court. And we've purchased a lot of intellectual property that's peripheral to the work that we're doing in order to create a very comprehensive set of protections around this space of nanolaminated alloys. So not all of our intellectual property was invented right here at Modumetal. Some of it was acquired from universities, from national laboratories, actually, and from other companies in order to create a really comprehensive intellectual property portfolio. Well, that's very helpful insight for other small companies. And, and really, that's the purpose of this podcast series is to try to share best practices across the technology development pathway so that people who are just getting started can learn from folks like you who have made significant progress and learn a little bit from your ups and downs. We're grateful beneficiaries of other people's lessons learned, so we're always happy to share our own. Well, fantastic. In, in that vein, can you share a strategy or decision that you made that in hindsight you might have done differently? Uh, sure. I, uh, I wish I could say that I don't have any decisions in, in career <laughs> that I would, I would like to rethink, but unfortunately that's, that's not the way this experience has unfolded. 
And one of the greatest challenges is I've learned in the experience with Modumetal and in starting up a venture and creating a new technology and really commercializing a new technology is in this area of scale up. And that's the kind of stage that we're engaged in actively at Modumetal, scaling up the technology, really bringing it to market. And there's a demand on the company to really focus at this stage. This happens to be the stage in our venture when we're deploying the most capital. The speed is of an essence. We're serving customers. So everything that we do right now directly impacts what is our core mission to deliver a capability and a solution to our customers. And so this concept of focus is absolutely critical for us. And that, that there are obviously a number of dimensions to focus everything from what products we focus on to what markets we focus on to what customers we focus on. And so we made some very challenging decisions roughly five years ago as a company about the kinds of markets we're gonna focus on and the kinds of customers as we worked to get our products specified and into the marketplace. We made a decision around the 2013 timeframe that carried into 2014 to focus on energy sector applications uh, of our corrosion resistant alloys, so specifically the oil and gas industry, uh, which is a major industry in the United States that supports our infrastructure in very real ways, our way of life and is directly impacted every day by corrosion and corrosion challenges that are getting worse as our, you know, sort of the resources that we're producing for energy get more and more challenging. And as we started our foray into that market, it was a very healthy market. There was a great opportunity for us to engage in the deployment of our materials. And of course, if you're familiar with the oil and gas industry, you're probably familiar with what happened at the end of 2014 mm-hmm. when, uh, when oil prices went from about $100 a barrel to about 20 And as a result, many of our colleagues, our customers, really had to tighten their belts. And several of the, the longtime collaborators that we had been working with were laid off from their jobs. And so it was just a major, major market upset. And those kinds of market shifts and market dynamics not only impact the industry directly, but they also impact companies like ours that are serving the industry. And especially for an early stage company creates quite a lot of challenges. So I do wish sometimes that I had that crystal ball that I could look into and say, you know, what what does the future hold? Unfortunately, I think <laughs> that that uh, that's going to be a long time coming. So I, I would say, you know, in hindsight, I wish we had known it was it was coming. We might not have changed our focus because I still think that the solution that we're bringing to the market is a critical solution, but it might have changed a little bit the tactics that we took as, as we approach the market. Right. And clearly that was a situation that was completely outside of your control, which is always a challenge. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about the National Nanotechnology Initiative and and the ecosystem that helps to support innovation and commercialization of nanotechnology. One of the goals of the initiative is to foster commercialization of nanotechnology and and their support for companies, you know, with respect to advice and those types of things, but then also with respect to user facilities. You have a a node of the National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure there in Seattle, and also things like SBIR awards through the agencies. I'm wondering, have you had an opportunity to take advantage of any of those resources that are available in in the NNI ecosystem? So Modumetal was actually, we were a founding member of the Nanoscience and Nanotechnology Center at the University of Washington. We're grateful beneficiaries of the resources that are supported there. Just for reference, that is a, it's a laboratory at the University of Washington on site that houses some very high power microscopy equipment, as well as characterization, so chemical characterization equipment that would, for a startup company, have been impossible for us to acquire, especially early on in our, in our life cycle but is absolutely critical to the kind of work that we do. So our ability to characterize our materials, our ability to validate, to study, using these kinds of tools is absolutely critical. So through the Nanoscience and Nanotechnology User Facility at the University of Washington, we were able to, for a small hourly fee, access that equipment that was maintained by the university through funding from NNI. 
And that continues to actually be a key resource for the company. We are still members of that user facility. We still leverage those resources. And so I think that's bringing some of those tools to bear in this entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, really does help to accelerate the work that we're doing. Beyond that, funding is always critical in early stage ventures. So as we started and for several years during startup, we were not revenue generating, we were not cash flow break even, and yet we had very clear vision about the kinds of products we wanted to bring to market. And obviously the United States government is a one such market that could be a great beneficiary of corrosion resistant alloys. And so we have also participated in the SBIR funding programs very early on as we were developing alloy systems and demonstrating feasibility. One of our first customers of our corrosion resistant alloys was the Coast Guard. And so we were able to bring our uh, nanolaminated coating technology for fasteners to some pretty extreme challenges that the Coast Guard was facing. And so I think it, it created an opportunity for a win-win where Maju Metal was able to advance the technology to the point of feasibility and the customer, in this case, the Coast Guard, was able to solve a problem. And so I think these are critical programs in terms of helping to connect some of those dots and foster what is otherwise very high, high risk research at an early stage to bring some, uh, some game changing solutions to the market. In addition to SBIR funding, you've been successful at raising venture capital. Can you share your, the secret to your success? Um, I think there are two things I would say on that point. I think first and foremost, you know, I asked myself before we went out to bring in funding from the government or from the venture capital community, would I take every penny that I earn and invested in this venture? Do I really believe that this is going to generate that kind of return? And when my answer was yes, then I could reasonably go and speak to other individuals about investing their hard-earned dollars in this technology that we're bringing to market. I think for venture capital, the objective is different. In the case of the SBIR program, it's trying to connect a solution with a need, and that solution can be a very high-risk, high-reward technology solution. In the case of venture capital, it's more a question of, is this going to create an outsized return? And so investors, in most cases, are looking for a financial return that they wouldn't otherwise be able to achieve through just the public markets. And so there are some elements to being able to answer that question, things like, you know, is the market large enough? Is our ability to capture, uh, you know, significant part of that market really achievable? Do we have an idea for a business model that will allow us to achieve market share capture in a cost-effective and re- profitable way. And so there's there were some critical questions we had to ask in order to be able to really approach the venture capital community. In our case, I mean, this is a huge market opportunity. I mentioned in corrosion alone, we're looking at over $2 trillion in direct costs in this corrosion mitigation sector. But beyond that as well, we have at Modumental a business model that just really makes sense for an investor an ability to bring the technology to market very quickly through a licensing approach. And so that was really a key to being able to attract venture capital and partnership of the venture capital community. Being based in Seattle, I would assume that it's challenging to get talent. It's a very lively city known for innovation. How has been your experience getting the workforce that you need? I think anywhere you go in the world where there are good people, there's always going to be a competition for talent. So, and Seattle is no stranger to that phenomena. You know, when you think about Seattle today, most people think about Starbucks and Amazon and Microsoft, but we consider ourselves lucky in in this metals manufacturing space to be here because there's a a highly skilled workforce uh, in the area of manufacturing and materials because of the presence of Boeing and the supply chains that support Boeing. We have the benefit of a world-class university right here in our backyard. And so that also contributes to the local talent pool that we're able to draw from. But we're obviously not the only people that have recognized that. And so you're absolutely right that there's quite a bit of competition. I think for us, and and this is especially an area that I'm focused on as CEO, is to attract talent 
to a venture like ours, there, it's critical that we create an environment that people want to work in. And I think probably the most important aspect of that environment is the mission and the sense of purpose that we give people. We have a very clear vision, a very exciting vision for what we are creating with Maju Metal and what we want to create with Maju Metal. It's a transformative opportunity in the metals industry and an opportunity for the individuals that work here to do something that is going to last well beyond their tenure here. And so I think that you know, that creates a cohesiveness. It creates a glue that keeps people around. We have very long tenured employees here at Maja Metal. And the one thing we all have in common is that we're all bought in on the mission and where we're headed. You know, the team is the absolutely the critical part of making this work. Christina, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to, to share your story with us and tell us more about your experience. Um, before we end today, do you have any parting thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? I would say just for all of those that are listening that have, you know, an idea that they've thought about going out to pursue. The one thing I would say, you know, I get up every day. I've been with this venture for almost 12 years now. Follow your passion. I mean, there's nothing more fulfilling with every day than, you know, getting up and knowing that we're going to make a difference, that I have an opportunity to make a difference. And I continue to be passionate about it every day. This this is obviously a venture that has its ups and downs and its challenges, but that opportunity to get up in the morning and know that we're creating something that is really going to make a difference, it is unbelievably fulfilling and exciting and I feel privileged to be able to do this. Thank you for joining us today for this special 15-year anniversary edition of Stories from the NNI. If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit nano.gov or email us at info at nnco.nano.gov. And check back here for more stories.